Ladies and gentlemen, thank you uh, for coming to this event. Uh, the event is co-sponsored by my own institution, the New York University Center for Dialogues, and the uh, Foreign Policy Association. Uh, we have been uh, lucky uh, to cooperate with the Foreign Policy Association over the last few years. We uh, organized jointly a number of events, and I'm happy that we are doing this again. Um, this uh, event, like others, are supposed to enlighten the public about crucial uh, policy issues. I would like also to thank my colleagues from the NYU Center for Dialogues, Aubrey Clark Brown, Jordan McFadden, and Vandula Brim for doing all the work to make this happen. Uh, let me uh, just uh, make a few uh, introductory remarks, and then I will introduce our guest and speaker for the evening. Uh, first, I would like to say this. Uh, you would agree with me that uh, the U.S. demonstrated remarkable staying power up until the Korean War. After defeating Nazi Germany, the U.S. did not back away and leave Europe to its own devices. The same applied to Japan. Imagine what history would have been if the U.S. did not stay. And the same applies, of course, to the aftermath of the Korean War. Was it a matter of uh, leadership, as exemplified by Truman, Eisenhower, Marshall, or others, both Democrats and the Republicans? Was it because the American people were more engaged, were still in the internationalist mood, these are legitimate questions when we think about today. Second, we know that starting with the Vietnam War until today, we only see orphans in the lands in which the US military intervened. Vietnam, Iraq, will Afghanistan be tomorrow that orphan? And so the question is, has the public mood changed? Or have American leaders lacked the vision and the resolution of Roosevelt, Truman, and Eisenhower? Third, you recall what uh, former Secretary of State Colin Powell Colin Powell said, he said it in the most striking metaphor to express what needs to be done but has lacked so far. And I quote, if you break it, you are going to own it. Had this rule been applied to Iraq, we probably would not be today in the dire situation in which the US is desperately trying to put together a coalition to defeat a terrorist group that evolved in the vacuum left in Iraq after the withdrawal of the American forces. With the most horrible consequences that we have witnessed in recent times. Fourth. What then of Afghanistan? Fortunately, with the election of a new president in Afghanistan and the signing of the bilateral security agreement last week, providing for 10,000 US and 2,000 NATO troops to remain in the country, 
following the end of the international combat mission at the end of this year, there might be hope. Wisdom on all sides seems to have prevailed. Maybe this will save Afghanistan and its most vulnerable groups, and I'm here I think mainly of women, would save them from the tragedy that swept Iraq after the American withdrawal. There is no better mind and thinker than Dr. Barnett Rubin to shed light on the Afghan situation. You all know Dr. Rubin's impact on the policies of this country with regard to Afghanistan, the good side. But let me say a few things more about his attributes. His director and senior fellow at the Center on International Cooperation of New York University. He has worked at the Center since July 2000. From 1994 to 2000, he was director of the Center for Preventive Action and director of Peace and Conflict Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations in New York. Dr. Rubin was Associate Professor of Political Science and Director of the Center for the Studies of Central Asia at Columbia University from 1990 to 1996. Previously, he was Jennings Randolph Peace Fellow at the United States Institute of Peace and Assistant Professor of Political Science at Yale University. On the policy side, from April 2000 until October 2013, Dr. Rubin was the senior advisor to the special, from, I'm sorry, from April 2009 to 2013, Dr. Rubin was the senior advisor to the special representative of the President of the United States for Afghanistan and Pakistan and the U.S. Department of State. In November, December, from November to December 2000, one, Dr. Rubin served as special advisor to the United Nations Special Representative of the Secretary General for, for Afghanistan during the negotiations that produced the Bonn Agreement. He advised the United Nations on the drafting of the Constitution of, of Afghanistan, the Afghanistan Compact, and the Afghanistan National Development Strategy. On the uh, publication side, this is the most recent book published last year, Afghanistan from the Cold War through the War on Terror. All the wisdom of Dr. Rubin is here, and I will urge you to buy it. It's still fresh. Uh, there are so many books by Dr. Rubin that will take me 10 more minutes to read the list. So instead of that, I will invite you to listen to him. Barry, the floor is yours. Yes. Okay. I'll wait till I get the water and then I'll stop. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> well, Mustafa, thank you very much for that uh, generous introduction, um, which makes it even harder for my next task for me to accomplish my next task, which is to disagree with you, <laughs> um, for which I, I sincerely apologize. Um, I don't think that U.S. permanent military presence is a solution to political problems around the world. Um, and the reason that Iraq 
the, the uh, chaos that exists in Iraq is not, is not so much the result of the U.S. withdrawal as of the U.S. invasion. We created that chaos. Um, now, let me say, but let me, uh, I'm not here to talk about Iraq, but let me talk a little bit, let me say a few words about Afghanistan, why the U.S. went in, what it tried to do, why we're leaving, and then what the future might hold. In 2001, before September 11th, the United States was spending a somewhat less than $100 million a year on Afghanistan uh, for humanitarian assistance. It was also spending an unknown amount uh, on, for counterterrorism operations, uh, a very small number of them, uh, trying to find out where Osama bin Laden was located and so on. But it was a relatively small amount, as you may know or may remember, the U.S. fired some cruise missiles at some uh, training camps in August 1998, uh, which were training camps of uh, Al-Qaeda, and supposedly we had intelligence that Osama bin Laden was at one of those camps, and that was after the bombing of the U.S. embassies in Kenya and Tanzania. As it turned out, he, he had been there, but he left, and most of the people we killed there were not Afghans or Arab members of Al-Qaeda. They were Punjabis from Pakistan who were being trained by the Pakistan Intelligence Agency uh, in order to fight against India in Kashmir. And they were using Taliban-controlled territory in Afghanistan to do that because they were under pressure internationally, especially from the United States, uh, not to do it. So this, this gave them uh, deniability. In, so I mention this to say that, just to give a concrete example of how the problem that we identify as terrorism, and specifically as terrorism against us, and as you may know in the recent debate about what the United States should do about the so-called Islamic State or Daesh or ISIL or ISIS. The main question that I've seen asked in the media in the United States was, are they trying to kill Americans? What is the uh, American interest in this? Now, whatever that group is trying to do, or what their ultimate may aims may be, currently they are killing only a very tiny number of Americans who have fallen into their clutches but they have killed thousands or perhaps tens of thousands of other people. And more importantly, they have uh, moved into the vacuum created by the U.S. invasion of Iraq and the subsequent weakness of the Iraqi regime to try to establish an alternative political order. In the, United, in the case of Afghanistan, we went very quickly from $100 million a year in humanitarian aid to $100 billion a year in mostly spent on military operations. Now, what gets, what motivates the United States to multiply its expenditures on a country like that by 1,000 in a short period of time? The answer was we were attacked from there. And we were attacked from there, very close to here. I actually was just across the street on Lafayette Street when it happened in September 11th. Actually, I was in the subway. And I found out about it because there was an announcement on the subway at, uh, at Union Square saying that if you were going below Fulton Street, you should transfer at Canal because this street was, this uh, train wasn't going to go below Fulton Street because of a plane crash at the World Trade Center. Um, so, therefore, we, re we responded. Now, the initial response on the part of the administration in 2001 was, we're going to find the people who did it, track them down, and bring justice to them. 
And in the initial days after September 11th, most of the diplomatic activity, in fact, as far as I know, all of the diplomatic activity uh, that the U.S. engaged in with respect to September 11th was aimed at getting the military bases, the intelligence assets, and the other logistical facilities that we would need to act militarily against those in Afghanistan who had attacked us. Now, of course, we were not attacked by Afghans. We were attacked by uh, a group of uh, Arabs. I don't mean we were attacked by the Arab, but you know, 15 people, uh, members of uh, the Al-Qaeda organization who had found refuge in Afghanistan, not originally, by the way, with the Taliban, um, but initially first in the 1980s when they were uh, part of the war effort that we were supporting. And then again after 1996 when under pressure from us and from Egypt, uh, Sudan expelled Osama bin Laden from Khartoum where he had been. And when he left Khartoum, he went to Afghanistan on a chartered flight, but he didn't go to Taliban territory. He went to uh, territory that was controlled by the Mujahideen-led government at the time. And uh, whatever documentation he received, if he received any, he got it from the foreign ministry, which was then headed by Dr. Abdullah, who today is the chief executive officer in the administration of President Ashraf Ghani. And he landed in Jalalabad. The, the Taliban met him only when they captured Jalalabad several months later. And uh, they didn't know what to do with him. But our response was, uh, uh, Taliban were harboring him. He was on their territory. Uh, and either they turn him over or we take down their regime. For various reasons, many reasons, they did not turn him over. Uh, but, and we took down their regime. Now, a few days, uh, about 10 days after September 11th, I was contacted, let's see, what well, actually it was 13 days after September 11th, by some colleagues in the State Department who said that I should come to Washington for a meeting uh, about what they said was the future of Afghanistan. Um, and that was uh, a brainstorming session in the State Department. And the problem was that for two weeks they had been working on how to invade Afghanistan, uh, destroy the Al-Qaeda infrastructure there, and if necessary, t uh, take down the regime of the Taliban, which they called the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan. But after they eventually realized, at least the, the State Department under Colin Powell, whom uh, Dr. Tulli mentioned, uh, pushed the notion that that we're going to have to do something with Afghanistan after they destroyed its current government, however obnoxious that government was, the you break it, you bought it idea. So this was uh, a meeting to decide what should be done after the military operation. And it was politically controversial within the administration because President Bush had run for office on a platform of no nation building. We shouldn't use our troops for nation building. Um, and it was with great reluctance that he and uh, others in his administration, such as Vice President Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld, were persuaded that there should be a, a political effort as well to build a government in Afghanistan, as well as uh, a development effort, not just a humanitarian assistance effort, you know, dropping meals on people who didn't have food, but an attempt to build up infrastructure and an economy there. Um, they delegated that task to the United Nations, uh, which is where I came in because at that time I was asked to serve with the United Nations by uh, Lakhtar Brahimi, I some of you know very well. Um, but the fact that they delegated the political task to the United Nations was a sign that they did not consider it to be important because if they had considered it important, they would have done it themselves. Or let's say they didn't consider it to be of strategic interest. And throughout our history in Afghanistan, from them to now, there have been and are tensions 
between the counterterrorism mission, which is actually the only reason that the United States and the international community is there in, at, the, uh, at the level of military and financial activity that they are there, and the political mission. Um, the political mission of stabilizing Afghanistan, uh, of building a new government. And in my experience, both as working for the UN and uh, outside the government, and also my experience four years working within the government, whenever the counterterrorism mission and the stabilization mission are in con were in conflict, the counterterrorism mission always won because that was the fundamental reason that we were there. And I should add, once you have troops on the ground, there's a third mission. And that is force protection. That is protecting those troops. And uh, protecting your troops can also be uh, antithetical to a stabilization mission. I'll come to that in a minute. Now, the first contradiction between those two missions was in the de a decision about how to organize the security of Afghanistan um, after the new government took over, after the United States and its allies had destroyed the previous government. In the Bonn Agreement, there was a provision for a multinational force, uh, which was aimed at actually keeping the various militias out of the capital city so that there could be civilian politics there, and eventually expanding it from Ka Kabul to other provinces. Um, that was in keeping with the stabilization mission. But it was several years until it expanded because the US Department of Defense did not want a military force with a stabilization mission operating in the same space as their counterterrorism missions. That is where they were, which they defined mainly as uh, targeted killings and detentions. So much of the country was then left to the de facto control of the various militias that had been, uh, that we had supported in order to overthrow the Taliban. There was quite a delay in uh, building up those security forces. Um, subsequently, and I won't go through the whole history, we don't have time, uh, but there w was a, an attempt to meld the two through the concept of counterinsurgency. Um, and the idea of uh, counterinsurgency is that, you know, it, it, you uh, use military force to deny access to certain areas to the enemy. Then you use that military force to secure that area so that your political allies can come in and build something. And then, you leave. Now, the leaving part is not part of the original counterinsurgency doctrine because the original counterinsurgency doctrine is based on colonial wars. And you will find, if you read the counterinsurgency literature, that the examples they cite are Algeria, Malaysia, and so on. And if your troops are going to stay there forever and build up their own government, then possibly counterinsurgency can work. For instance, in Colombia they used a similar model, but it was the government of Colombia doing it. However, what happens when you do have foreign troops doing counterinsurgency is they get the impression that they're there to win the hearts and minds of the people for them. So counterinsurgency becomes confused with force protection. Then you add uh, the force protection adds another dynamic, which is contrary to counterinsurgency, which is how much risk do you accept for your own troops in order to protect the civilians of the country you are in? Let me give you a concrete example of what, what that means. Suppose that uh, you are taking fire from a village, from the Taliban, which is uh, potentially killing some of your forces. You don't know what's in that village. Do you call in an airstrike and destroy it? Do you bombard it with artillery 
Do you try to move closer until you can see more clearly who is there? Well, the more, the less risk you're willing to take for your forces in that situation, the more likely you are to kill civilians. Um, when General Stanley McChrystal became the commander in 2009, he actually introduced very strict rules against the use of, uh, limitations on the use of air power, and was trying to protect civilians more. This was very unpopular with many of the troops, not because they wanted to kill civilians, but because they wanted to save their own lives. Politically, of course, people in Washington are concerned of all, all the discussions I had in, in the government are almost entirely about saving American lives. S saving Afghan lives was discussed, but as a uh, an operational goal rather than a fundamental premise of our policy. And when he was replaced by General Petraeus, a lot of those regulations were loosened. Now, second, coming back to the point I made about the way that terrorism is nested in other problems. The fact that in order to act in a complex situation, it is inevitable that you must conceptually simplify it in order to make a decision. The question is, and how do you do that? Is this, and do you oversimplify it? The main lens through which our fundamental policy was determined there was the counterterrorism lens. And that led us to make certain decisions about, in particular, how to treat the Taliban. Now, again, come back to the point. We were in, the Taliban did not attack us. Al Qaeda attacked us. While they were uh, also supporting the Taliban in their s war inside Afghanistan, and there's no evidence that the Taliban themselves have an international agenda. The day after the Bonn Agreement was signed. The Taliban by then had been pushed out of most of Afghanistan and they were back in southern Afghanistan um, around the city of Kandahar, which is where they are from and also where President Hamid Karzai is from. Karzai was camped outside the city. The Taliban were in Kandahar city and they were exchanging messages through intermediaries. And they reached an agreement that the Taliban would peacefully hand over to Hamid Karzai and his government the four provinces that they still controlled and agree to a truce in return for an amnesty. That is, that they would not be arrested, harassed, killed, and so on. So Hamid Karzai agreed to that. And from the point of view of stabilization of Afghanistan, that would have been a very positive development the Taliban would have been disarmed. Some of them might have entered into the uh, political process. They had not all gone to Pakistan with uh, Al-Qaeda and so on. In fact, as soon as the war started, bin Laden left Kandahar because he didn't trust the Taliban leadership and went back to uh, an area of eastern Afghanistan where he felt more comfortable. Um, but Donald Rumsfeld, who was then Secretary of Defense, gave a press conference saying there will be no negotiated solution and the U.S. policy was those who harbor terrorists will meet the same fate as the terrorists themselves. They shouldn't think that they can do that and then enter into a political solution. The result of that was that we end, uh, you know, along with many other things, that we ended up with a, an insurgency in Afghanistan based in Pakistan which has its own interests in Afghanistan, which we can discuss in the question period if, if you like. And we tried to build a government in Afghanistan um, basically by training and funding people to carry out technical tasks. Now, once we do that, of course, the people who participate in those institutions, they have their own political and economic strategies, which may be consistent with what we want uh, uh, or may not be. But in f I, I'm not saying, uh, actually contrary to what some critics say, 
uh, and I, I, you know, institutions that now exist in Afghanistan are not a Western imposition. Um, they are, uh, they develop through an international process, but Afghans have some ownership of them, some more than others, and they function in a rather, you know, rather poor way, but, uh, you know, this election eventually had some kind of a result. There is a, a tradition of statecraft in Afghanistan, which to some extent has been revived. But it's not sufficient without a fundamental political settlement among the major stakeholders in the society, and that our counterterrorism did not allow us to pursue. Um, yet, uh, and to, uh, when President Obama came to office, his, his um, main policy change about Afghanistan was one, focus primarily on Al-Qaeda. Second, get out of Iraq, because Iraq had nothing to do with 9-11, and I'll come back to that a little bit and make some comments on what Mustafa said earlier. And try to make sure not to defeat the Taliban, because President Obama understood uh, that wasn't possible. They can't be defeated or eliminated, but to assure that they're unable to take power through violence. Now, to make that policy change was extraordinarily difficult because we had a whole, we had and have a whole apparatus of counterterrorism in the government based on laws, beliefs, and so on. And the centerpiece of it, of course, was Guant is Guantanamo, where Taliban and Al Qaeda are confined together. Um, none of the Taliban prisoners have been charged with any crimes because they weren't involved in attacking anyone. When the Taliban started to reach out for uh, some kind of talks with the United States, I'm not saying necessarily for a political settlement, perhaps uh, they had other goals in mind, but for some talks, well, their first demand really was the release of their prisoners from Guantanamo as a sign that the United States did not consider them to be a terrorist group like Al Qaeda. Now, Eventually that happened, uh, as you know, a few months ago in May, uh, as a prisoner swap with someone that the of our people, with Sergeant Bo Bergdahl that the Taliban were holding. But there was tremendous resistance within the government, Congress, and public opinion to doing this, even though they were going to be released under very restrictive conditions. Um, because of this armature I would say both ideological and, and administrative of counterterrorism. Now, once, after we had been there for, you know, we've now been uh, militarily in Afghanistan for 13 years, why did President Obama decide on this withdrawal and limited forces afterwards? Um, and here, I think you have to understand the job of the President of the United States. Of course, the, I would say probably most of the military commanders and many of the civilians involved with Afghanistan feel uh, somewhat disappointed that we are getting out before we have actually finished the job. Um, but the President of the United States' job description is not to reform Afghanistan whatever the cost. The job description of the President of the United States is to protect the Constitution and the interests of the United States. And President Obama determined, and I think reasonably, I think one, two things, that whatever interests we have in Afghanistan does not justify spending $100 billion a year and losing hundreds of lives every year, especially if we take into account the opportunity costs. That is that if we spend those resources in Afghanistan, we cannot spend them elsewhere. We cannot spend them either for counterterrorism elsewhere in the world, or we cannot spend them for some of the domestic investment that we need very badly. Now, second, the argument is still, if you have an investment, don't you want to preserve it? I think he reached a conclusion, which I must say is, uh, I, I actually agree with, which that 
there is very little evidence that doing the same thing longer would have a better result. That actually is a leap of faith based on the uh, counterinsurgency doctrine. In fact, I, I think, uh, my view is, based on my observation of Afghan society, how much the United States doesn't know about it, how awkwardly it engages with it, and, uh, that um, we've accomplished, whatever we have accomplished for good and ill is what we can accomplish. And of course, when you intervene with hundreds of billions of dollars in a country whose GDP is about $15 billion a year, that is our intervention costs several times the GDP of Afghanistan, you completely change people's behavior. Uh, I sometimes say, you know, people say there's corruption in, in Afghanistan, it's a part of their culture. Well, I say, imagine if the United States were occupied by a force of the Chinese military uh, who were giving out $10 trillion in cash every year and none of them spoke English. Okay. Uh, how well would our institutions stand up to that? Uh, so that's, that's approximately the situation that Afghanistan has been in with uh, this amount of money coming in. And basically until they know that there's some kind of, the people in the region, both the neighbors of Afghanistan and the power holders there know that there is some kind of a, a deadline, even if it's a soft deadline, they will not make the decisions that they need to make in order to provide stability to themselves. And let me give you a very concrete example. This election that just occurred. Now, my view of the election is, I, I'm not gonna say who I think actually won the election. My main uh, analysis of it is that institutions in Afghanistan are too weak to decide a, a real contested presidential election in a way that is convincing to everybody in Afghanistan. There's no census. People don't know how many people live in different areas, so they don't have any agreement on what's a reasonable number of votes from different areas. Um, there's no population registration. People don't have consistent first names and last names. They don't have addresses. They don't have, uh, in most cases, they don't have identity cards. A significant part of the country is not accessible to the state because it is controlled by the Taliban insurgents. Uh, so therefore, you can either uh, disenfranchise all the people who live in those areas, who belong to one ethnic group mainly, Pashtuns, or pseudo-enfranchise them by casting their votes for them in some way. Uh, and half of the country's population has been displaced in one way or another. That is, uh, either within the country or outside the country within the past 30, 40 years. Um, and it's not always clear after all that time who is a citizen of what country, people move back and forth. So there are all kinds of reasons that the institutions are very weak. And let me mention just something else which I haven't mentioned, which is often neglected. Afghanistan is one of the 10 poorest countries in the world. Afghanistan is the poorest country in Asia by far. Someone said to me, is it sort of like Bangladesh? No, it's much poorer than Bangladesh. The GDP of Afghanistan per capita is less than the GDP per capita of Haiti. Okay. Now, it doesn't look that way now because GDP is what you produce domestically. And there's a lot of, most of the wealth in Afghanistan now is not produced domestically. Also, the GDP figure doesn't include the criminal economy, such as uh, drug trafficking. Um, but given that whether the United States stays there another 10 years, another 20 years, another 30 years, another 40 years, eventually the United States is going to leave Afghanistan because Afghanistan is a landlocked country very far from us. It's not important to our security and our economy the way Europe was after World War II or the way Japan was after World War II. The United States is not a dominant world power in any way as it was after World War II. It no longer controls over half of world GDP. We have live in a, uh, it's still the United States is by far the largest economy, but there are many other emerging large economies and militaries in the world. It's impossible for the United States to act now the way it acted uh, after, uh, after World War II and in Korea. And it's not in our interest to do so because that was the era of colonialism. And 
M many countries that were then under colonial rule are now independent. Some of them are developing. And they have their uh, own ideas about uh, how the world should be organized and what, how they want their countries to be run. And they have, in many cases, the capacity to do something about it. So it doesn't mean we withdraw, but we have to act in much more complex ways. That's why my center is called the Center on International Cooperation. So uh, coming back to the election, in the second round, the two candidates could not agree on who won. The uh, Dr. Abdullah, whose support mainly came from non-Pashtun ethnic groups in northern Afghanistan, in particular Tajiks, uh, believed that there was he a heavy fraud orchestrated in the Pashtun areas so that his rival Ashraf Ghani would win. Ashraf Ghani claimed that there was fraud on both sides, but in fact he had mobilized people in those areas. There was an extensive audit of the, overseen by the United Nations of all of the ballots, but still, if you're very, uh, uh, and which led to a, a, a vote count in which Ashraf Ghani won clearly, even after a million votes, uh, had possibly fraudulent votes had been eliminated. But there's not sufficient trust in the institutions in Afghanistan to convince those on the other side that that is true. And, and that is why they entered into negotiations over some kind of a power sharing agreement. These negotiations were very difficult because there's one fact about any organization and even more so about a state. Somebody has to be responsible. You cannot have two people that are responsible because then the people in that whole organization don't know whom to listen to and particularly in a patronized, patronized, patronage run, factionalized society, the state will cease to function and instead break down into various uh, patronage networks if you do not have clear lines of authority. So figuring out how to share power in a very centralized, the weak state was very, very difficult. And the only reason, I, I won't say the only reason, uh, but a very s strong reason that they did so was that if they did not, they knew that the financial and military support that kept their government alive would be withdrawn. And therefore, they wouldn't have a government. So they had a, even the side that got less had to face the question, do we want to risk everything in order to have 100% of nothing? Or will we settle to have 48% of something? And really, that's a very, I know, some, uh, you know, it sounds funny, but that's a very difficult decision for a politician, especially because uh, power conflicts are often zero sum and might involve your survival. But, and I think this is a credit to the character of those individuals as well as to the pressure they were under, they made that decision. The only reason, I think those two individuals, Ashraf Ghani and Dr. Abdullah, would have been willing to make that decision and make those hard choices themselves. But they could not bring their followers along who expected to get tremendous benefits from being in power were it not for the fact that they would face consequences resulting from the withdrawal of resources. Now, fortunately, because of that, we don't have to withdraw our resources in uh, such a sudden and damaging way. We are going to withdraw them in a more gradual way. Uh, in Iraq, we were unable to reach an agreement with the very sectarian government of Maliki about uh, keeping our troops there, and therefore we didn't keep our troops there. Um, in Afghanistan, we will keep our troops there. but. I think it's a misunderstanding, I think it's a very common uh, misunderstanding of the situation to think that the result in Iraq or the result in Afghanistan is primarily military. That if our troops had kept, stayed there, the military would have been stronger and the government would have had more control. Or if we withdraw our troops from Afghanistan, the government will collapse. I don't believe, uh, and if we keep them there, the military will be stronger. I don't believe that's true. The, although there's an element of truth to it because a government to stay together, and in order for a, an army to fight, an army is only an army if it is fighting for a legitimate government. 
The problem in Iraq, I believe, was the legitimacy of the government, not the lack of training or equipment of the army. And the trouble in Iraq was not the funding of the army or the government, because Iraq is an oil state. Afghanistan, it's a, very, it's a different situation because, as I mentioned, it's one of the ten poorest countries in the world. It cannot fund its state institutions or security forces without external funding. And I would argue that it's the external funding, people getting paid, combined with a degree of political legitimacy, which keeps the country afloat. And therefore, the threat posed by the Taliban is not primarily a military threat. If the Taliban were going to succeed in Afghanistan, it would not be because they overwhelmed an Afghan army that did not have sufficient arms or training. It would be because the government was torn by internal dissension, had a coup, and different parts of the army defected to different sides so that the state collapsed, which has happened several times in Afghan history, most recently in 1992. In that case, you know, when you're part of an organization that is collapsing in an environment like that, every individual faces a choice, and your number one priority is to save your life and that of your family. And that means, you know, get out of the conflict situation and find somewhere safe, whether it means going back to your village and tribe, getting out of the country, something like that. So institutions crumble quite quickly. Then in that vacuum, Taliban could move in to some extent. But that would not be because of a lack of military training or equipment. It would be because of political weaknesses. So right now, the most important thing for stabilizing the country is to maintain a sufficient level of funding to support the unity of the national unity government and to build a coalition of regional powers uh, that will be supportive of uh, Afghanistan. And here I'll just end with this. In two weeks, two weeks, or is it three weeks? What is it? It's the sixth. In three weeks, Pr President Ashraf Ghani of Afghanistan will pay his first state visit abroad. And that will be to China. And he will be going to China at that time because China is chairing a regional process called the Istanbul process or the Heart of Asia process which is a regional process of support for the stabilization of Afghanistan. And he will attend the annual ministerial meeting, which is being held in Tianjin, China, on the 31st of October. In addition, China now considers the stability of Afghanistan to be key to the internal security of China because of their own uh, ethnic and political problems with uh, the Uyghur ethnic group in western China. Now, uh, of course, it's not their prob Chinese problems in that area are not primarily because of foreign trained terrorists from Afghanistan or Pakistan. It's because of uh, their own internal problems. But nonetheless, um, there is that external aspect of it, which me makes China much more proactive, which means that there's, a a and I should say India is similarly becoming much more proactive because India faces its own threats from the regions, including from, in the region, including from Pakistan. And India and China are now fast-growing economies, not to be compared, you know, to the United States. China is, you know, I think twice the size of India, its economy. Um, but they are in the neighborhood. They cannot leave. If Afghanistan is going to be stabilized, it will be stabilized through a transition in which the United States gradually leaves. The government has sufficient political legitimacy, and the international support that Afghanistan needs as it transitions to greater self-sufficiency will come increasingly from a coalition of its neighbors. That's very challenging, and I'm not predicting that that will happen. Actually, as I sometimes say, to be, you, you don't need any, you, you can be brain dead and still be pessimistic about Afghanistan. And, um, you know, if you predict that things will go wrong without doing any analysis, you will still be right 95% of the time. And uh, that is how the intelligence agencies keep their uh, sterling record. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I think there is a chance. Um, Afghanistan is not going to be the United States' orphan because it's not our child. It belongs to itself. And it has a leader with a vision now, I think, and um, some opportunities, which I hope we will help them make use of. Thank you.
presentation introducing uh, uh, Dr. Rubin, but uh, I think I won the game because being provocative made him more interesting. <laughs> So, the uh, floor is yours. Please ask questions. I will take three. Can I just ask, I, um, just to satisfy my curiosity yeah. about who's here, I would appreciate it if you would identify yourself before uh, asking your question. So maybe three questions at time. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, Ed Friedman, Ed Friedman oh, from right. Stevens Institute of Technology. Uh, uh, Barney, could you say a few words about the uh, third neighbor, uh, Iran? You want to take three questions? Yeah, three questions. Yes. Hello, my name is Samia, and my question is similar to the first one. You did not mention anything about Pakistan. What's the role of Pakistan in the whole negotiation process? What its role will be in the future? I should add that Samia is from Pakistan. Okay. Um, actually, I did mention Pakistan. For instance, I, I, I little, yes. Um, Pakistan and Iran are Afghanistan's two most important neighbors. Uh, they both have uh, ethnic groups that overlap the two countries. Uh, the relationship with Pakistan is in many respects uh, closer but also much more contentious. Um, Afghanistan's access to the international trade system, uh, you know, Afghanistan's a landlocked country. Landlocked countries are dependent on transit, whether it is transit by land or transit by air. And for historical reasons, Afghanistan's main transit has been through what was previous, you know, Indi the Indian subcontinent through the area that is now Pakistan. In addition, you have the complex ethnic ties across the border, and most of the Afghan refugees uh, in the 1980s went to Pakistan. Pa Afghanistan also never has, has officially recognized its border with Pakistan, and the Pashtun ethnic group, which lives in both countries, which is the largest ethnic group in, Pakistan, in Afghanistan, but a minority in Pakistan, Nonetheless, there are twice as many Pashtuns in Pakistan as there are in Afghanistan, because Pakistan's a much larger country, um, have at times articulated uh, transnational aspirations. And I found it's still a very emotional issue for many people in Afghanistan, including, I might mention, Hamid Karzai and Ashraf Ghani, uh, that uh, the British separated part of those areas from Afghanistan in the late 19th century. Uh, and incorporated them into India, now in Pakistan. And Afghanistan has never uh, officially recognized that border. Now, this is not an unusual situation. There are, the whole world consists of unfair, unjust borders imposed by violence in the course of history. And the process of stabilization is a polite way of saying that we're trying to get people to accept past injustices so we can move on and live in the future. Um, but that, as well as other issues connected to the Cold War, so many things, have led Pakistan to use armed groups as part of its policy toward Afghanistan to try to weaken and destabilize the government. And when Pakistan, when you get into very deep conversations with Pakistan, uh, military people in particular about what they will do about uh, Afghanistan, it turns out that uh, they say they will do something about the Taliban in return for two things. One is guarantees that India will not use Afghan, Afghan territory against Pakistan. 
And the second is that Afghanistan will abandon its claim, transborder claims over Pashtun territories. And Afghanistan, in fact, President Karzai mentioned those two things in his farewell address. Um, and those are things that Afghans generally find uh, unacceptable, though there are ways of negotiating them, uh, you know, in ways that are reasonable, but it's, it's uh, quite difficult, especially when both governments are quite politically vulnerable at home. Um, of course, Pakistan is facing its own domestic insurgency and tremendous political instability, um, and right now is not in a position really to make any strategic decisions. Um, however, here we come back to China. Pakistan's relationship with China is its most important international relationship. It describes that as a, its all-weather friend. And yet China, and China also describes its relationship with Pakistan in very positive ways, yet China has become somewhat disenchanted with Pakistan uh, because of its inability to control terrorism or to provide security for the Chinese in Pakistan. Just to give a very prominent example, recently President Xi Jinping of China went on a state visit to India. He was supposed to go to Pakistan as well, um, but his security people told him it wasn't safe for him to go to Pakistan. So he didn't go to Pakistan, he only went to India. Now he may go to Pakistan later as part of a trip also to Bangladesh, but that means Pakistan will be grouped with Bangladesh, not with India. And still that isn't certain either because it depends on the security situation in Pakistan. Now that puts a certain amount of pressure on Pakistan without China having to say anything because Pakistan needs China. And China does not want the Taliban to succeed militarily in Afghanistan. It wants a political settlement with them. But it doesn't want them, and that puts some limits on what Pakistan can do. Nonetheless, the government of Pakistan is uh, in a very, <laughs> it's quite disorganized right now. You know, they have this huge political crisis. It doesn't seem capable of making decisions. Now, Iran is not at all disorganized. It's, it's one of the most stable and strong governed states in the region, has a strong national identity. And Afghanistan is one of those areas where the United States and Iran have many common interests. Uh, the United States and Iran collaborated in overthrowing the Taliban in 2001. Uh, they collaborated diplomatically, which I saw myself at the Bonn talks. They also collaborated on the ground. Uh, the Iranian intelligence agency helped the CIA uh, establish bases in Afghanistan at that time. Uh, however, shortly thereafter, in, in, his, in the 2002 State of the Union address, President Bush responded to that, and this was the time that Khatami was president, not Ahmadinejad, uh, by putting Iran on the axis of evil, which uh, the Iranians were hoping, at least let's say the reformist Iranians who were very influential at that time, I won't say they were in power, but they controlled the presidency and, and, and the foreign ministry, were hoping that cooperation in Afghanistan would lead to something more, but of course it didn't. And the fact that we have very strong uh, conflict with Iran over the nuclear issue and over regional issues in the Middle East has meant that both countries are inhibited from cooperating in Afghanistan. Nevertheless, in a, rec in a recent meeting, President Karzai told some American visitors, this was a meeting about the electoral issue, the electoral controversy, the only two countries that, ca that count in Afghanistan are the United States and Iran. He didn't mean in general, but specifically for the electoral issue because those are the two countries that had influence with the candidates and influence on the ground. Unfortunately, the United States and Iran could not collaborate directly, could not coordinate directly, but they found ways to communicate through media, intermediaries and so on, so as at least not to misunderstand each other. And successfully, they both supported uh, this agreement. Whether they are able to cooperate more in Afghanistan is really dependent on whether they reach a nuclear agreement. Um, 
and that is independent of the fact that they do have common interests there. It's a similar situation to uh, the one in I Iraq. Uh, women. Well, first, women of Afghanistan are very diverse. The uh, women that we are more familiar with uh, are urban educated women. The majority of Afghan women are rural, illiterate, and have a very different set of problems. The, uh, I think that the, I forget what the index is called, but the, the whatever it is, it's a kind of gender misery index. Uh, you know, Afghanistan is at the top of that in the, in the world. But while the Taliban aggravated that in certain respects, uh, they didn't invent it. Partly it's a result of extreme poverty, highly patriarchal and tribal culture. And I would say uh, the most important thing we can do in the long run, or the short run too actually, short medium run, is, well there are two things. One maintain political stability and security because when there's instability and insecurity then families do are very uh, confine women and girls and don't let them out and two keep funding education and supporting education um, because programs that we make up to do something for women in another country. Sometimes they ha are helpful, sometimes they're not. But if the women themselves are educated, then they will do something. And they will have the resources to do it. So uh, support for education, I would say, is the most important thing. But I, we, there was one famous incident, which you may have seen. Remember there was a, 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 a girl, I think she was about 16 years old or something, who was uh, I forget what they accused her of doing, but anyway, her in-laws cut off her nose, right? And uh, she was on the cover of Time Magazine. And Time Magazine ran a headline saying, what happens when we leave? Implying that this is what would happen to the women of Afghanistan when the United States left. The problem with that was that happened to a woman in Afghanistan while the United States was there. It didn't happen when we left which I think indicates that our military presence is not a solution for all social problems. Um, what they really need is education, growth of public services, um, and that's a that is a long-term proposition, not something that troops can replace. Hi, thank you um, for your remarks. My question is, um, I guess the economist ran... Hi, Roger Blissett, I'm a trustee of the Foreign Policy Association. The economist had a, a, a prescription for Afghanistan in, in this week's issue that um, basically laid at the doorstep of the president that if he uh, you know, is too um, measured in, his, um, uh, in the forces he leaves behind in Afghanistan, he may be on the, on the threshold of creating the same problem that. Uh, we're seeing now in, in Iraq. Notwithstanding what you said in your remarks about the two countries being different, how do you size the appropriate level of forces in transitioning down uh, to restoring or to providing military uh, uh, support uh, for a nascent uh, democracy like Afghanistan? Well, oh, sorry. Um, Professor Rubin, thank you for your very erudite uh, talk. One very specific question. You did refer to the division of power between the two um, who now share power under this agreement, the president and the chief executive, which is an extra constitutional arrangement. Division of power is not unknown. It happens here if the White House is with one party and Congress with the other. You had cohabitation in France, but those were constitution, within the Constitution. So to my mind, now it comes down, the question comes down to whether these two gentlemen 
are willing to work with each other to stabilize Afghanistan, or one or the other will try and weaken the other one in order to gain more power, which could lead to instability. Would you wish to comment on what is likely? Hillary Cecil Jordan, Cecil Associates. Um, what do you think will happen with the Iran uh, nuclear negotiations? Okay. Uh, I'll answer them, uh, or uh, I will respond to them in the order in which they were asked. I'm not a military person. I have no military training, and I have no way to estimate troop numbers. However, I will just repeat something President Karzai said, which I think is accurate, which is that the numbers are not important. What's important is the political support. Because a government can't survive because foreign troops are propping it up. You know, our troops will not be involved in combat. We need a certain amount for uh, or, or let's say it is beneficial to some extent to have them there in advisory and training capacity. Um, there are two different ways of analyzing that question. One is the way, you see, if a, if a, if a military uh, advisor of the president, such as the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, gets a question, what number of troops would we need to uh, succeed or to accomplish a certain objective, then he will come up with a technical estimate of that. But then the president has to do something else. Because as I said, he's not the president of succeeding in Afghanistan, he's the president of the United States. Um, he has to look at all the other demands on his resources. He has a budget and of course, uh, as Dave Petraeus w once said, well, someone asked him if he had enough troops. He said, no commander will ever say he has enough troops. Uh, so it's never enough. But he has to decide where the, uh, our interests lie, where uh, around, and it's a very complex world, and therefore uh, uh, with many demands on us, financial, and we still need, you know, the basis of national power and strength is still our economy, which has some severe weaknesses and we need to invest in those things. Um, so uh, I think he, he found that there is no right number, you know. And he, he, found, he was trying to create a kind of a, um, a glide path that will provide an environment where people in the region will be, in Afghanistan and the region, will have to make some difficult decisions which they could avoid for a while because we were spending $100 billion a year, which we're not going to be doing indefinitely. I'm not blaming them for that or you know, labeling them as this or that, but it simply changes the political, and we need to help them do that and not uh, abandon them. I might say one of the things that worries me is that um, so much of the discussion about the country has been about democracy, human rights, protection of the rights of women, and so on, um, that it will be extremely easy to abandon Afghanistan with a very good conscience. Because if you ever want to find an excuse not to aid the country, you won't have any difficulty <laughs> in finding things that are wrong. Um, but. I hope we will still continue to uh, try to help them overcome those things. Uh, Iqbal's question. <clears throat> um, actually, you're quite right that it's, this is not a stable arrangement and it's extra constitutional and part of the agreement between them is that within two years they will convene a constitutional loy jirga to consider amending the constitution uh, to create an office of uh, executive prime minister uh, so that it will become a constitutional mechanism. Of course, even within constitutional mechanisms, 
There are occasionally struggles for power among different officials and branches of government. Uh, and I'm sure that would be, uh, that will be the case in Afghanistan as well. Um, uh, actually, I've just written an article on this, on this subject about the form of government and the changes of it, which isn't out yet, but uh, I'll just, since we're, uh, you know, have limited time, I'll just uh, remind, it, it's quite, you know, our, our system of government in the United States is not working particularly well right now. And we're not one of the 10 poorest countries in the world with uh, 40 years of internal armed conflict. So uh, I think it's fair to say that whatever system of government Afghanistan has, it will be full of problems. During the um, constitutional process 10 years ago, I was having a discussion with someone you probably know, Francesc Vandrell, who at that time was the European Union Special Representative and we were going back and forth arguing about presidential system versus parliamentary system. He actually was a strong advocate of monarchy uh, since he is a, an Anglophile Spaniard. Um, uh, monarchy with a parliamentary system. But finally he said, well, whoever loses this argument will be proven right because whatever system they have, it won't work. <laughs> so, but. I must say, those two individuals, I know them both the great, both well. They both have some flaws, but I believe they are really committed to trying to make this work uh, for the next two years. It'll be quite challenging. Uh, the third question is an easy one because there's a three-word answer, uh, which is, I don't know what will happen. Uh, but maybe if I could just try to be a little more helpful. I can't predict what will happen, but as it becomes clear that there are serious problems with the agreement, the political environment in Iran is becoming much more contentious. And the hardliners uh, are mobilizing and making things much more difficult for those in Iran who would like that agreement to succeed and would like it to be the first stage of an opening to, to the West. And every day I read about uh, problems that they are having. Uh, I think that it's in very strongly in our interest to empower the reformist group within Iran. Um, and it would be worth, in my personal view, taking some small risks on the nuclear side in order to enable them to have that win. I think that the uh, threat posed by Iran having nuclear materials or a nuclear program has been greatly overstated. Um, but our own politics, and I mentioned before the um, huge institution, institutional and ideological resources devoted to a certain conception of counterterrorism, makes it very difficult for us to move as well as for the Iranians. Sandra Stein, thank you so much. Um, I wonder if I could ask you, uh, what do you think of our approach to ISIS? Well, whatever I say would be much more convincing if I could terminate my remarks by explaining exactly how to solve the problem. Uh, and I regret to say that I do not have uh, such a solution. Um, the easy part of any policy debate is to prove why someone else's proposal won't work. Uh, and uh, if you look at the r rhetoric of policy debates, you'll find that's what people spend most of their time doing. Um, I do not want to spend time explaining why all the things we're trying to do about ISIS won't work um, because it's uh, just a very difficult problem. Um, I think we should not have the illusion that we can reorganize the Middle East in some way by giving a few millions of dollars here, a few weapons there. Um, what I, I, what I actually, I'll just mention a little intellectual struggle that I am uh, going through. I was, of course, opposed to the invasion of Iraq. Uh, nonetheless, of course, Saddam Hussein was committing major human rights violations, very severe ones. However, since we overthrew him, 
since we overthrew his tyrannical regime, except in, uh, the situation has greatly improved in Kurdistan and deteriorated probably in the rest of Iraq. So how do you evaluate that? Let's look at Libya. Um, our military operation in Libya was originally uh, intended and articulated as a humanitarian action to prevent the slaughter of civilians in Benghazi. It ended up overthrowing a personalistic autocratic dictatorship and replacing it with a civil war. I might say in Afghanistan also, we helped overthrow the regime of President Najibullah in 1992 and one of uh, a prominent Soviet specialist on Afghanistan who has since died, Yuri Gonkovsky, so I can mention his name because he cannot be harmed from my quoting him anymore, uh, said to me while we were in a taxi in Washington DC and he was confident that no one could overhear him, he said it's impossible for someone like Najibullah to stay in Afghanistan because he's covered in blood from head to toe, because Najibullah was head of the secret police. Nonetheless, when the people we were supporting overthrew this man covered in blood from head to toe, the situation got worse. <laughs> so uh, these are the moral dilemmas. I would just say that uh, generally, uh, the more I live through these experiences, um, the more skeptical I become that there is a coercive or military solution to the problem of human rights violations. Jürgen Schwering, I'm from Germany. Which role can the Europeans play in Afghanistan, if at all? And uh, if I may add, uh, you spoke about India's role in Afghanistan. Do you think India can replace the US in Afghanistan? There were discussions recently in Washington when the Indian Prime Minister was here and they apparently spoke also about Afghanistan. If so, what can India's role be in Afghanistan? Hi, I'm Alex Cohen, and given that the Afghan government still needs a lot of help, should we be maintaining a large civilian presence to uh, build up their institutions, given that you said they have apparently every problem under the sun? Um, well, let me answer that one first, but uh, a large civilian presence destroys their institutions because when you have a large civilian presence, all the people who should be working in their institutions are instead working as drivers and translators. <laughs> and as security guards for the foreigners. So uh, a, a large civilian presence was, is a transitional measure and actually would be quite uh, damaging to Afghans, inst Afghanistan's institutions. And I know from my personal acquaintance with him that no one is more convinced of what I just said than President Ashraf Ghani, who has kicked quite a few foreign civilians out of his office. Uh, when he was f finance minister. By the way, foreigners don't always know more than uh, people who live there. They have certain technical skills sometimes, but they don't know how to apply them in those different situations. So the added value that they bring, I find, is often exaggerated. Now, with respect to India and Europe, um, of course, Europe is important because they can give money. but. Uh, uh, and uh, you know what we call burden sharing. I should add that in the troop presence after the end of the current NATO deployment, uh, as I think Mustafa said, uh, there will be, I forget the exact numbers, but 8,000 US and 2,000 2000. 2000 Europeans. 
NATO. I believe there will mostly be Germans and Italians in northern and western Afghanistan, and that, that's a significant, uh, a significant contribution. Um, in addition, it just having a very broad diplomatic coalition is very helpful. Plus, certain countries have specific roles. Uh, you, 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 you are from Germany. Um, Germany has played a, a specifically a, a, an important role because, for instance, when the Taliban wanted to reach out and communicate with the United States, first they tried to do it through Saudi Arabia. They found that very difficult. Next, they did it through Germany. And uh, actually, Afghans have a, uh, a special feeling for Germany because, like them, it fought against the British and the Russians. Now, this leads to some very confusing and embarrassing situations sometimes, embarrassing above all for Germans. Um, but nonetheless, Afghanistan has a history of specific relations with specific countries um, that are significant uh, and they play special roles. With respect to India, uh, India cannot take the place of the United States. No one should try to take the place of the United States in Afghanistan because the role the United States has been playing in Afghanistan has been a transitional one. Uh, Afghanistan, th there's no long-term plan for keeping 100,000 foreign troops and spending $100 billion a year in Afghanistan. Uh, and I'm not aware that India is interested in doing that at all. Um, however, uh, in addition, of course, uh, an ex a certain types of Indian presence in Afghanistan, in particular military, would, be, would lead to a Pakistani reaction a very damaging Pakistani reaction. It would be the sovereign right of Afghanistan to cause that reaction if it wished to do so. But I think, uh, you know, and I've been to India many times to discuss these issues with them. The Indian government does not wish to provoke such a reaction. And therefore, it has, uh, provi it has uh, provided very well appreciated development programs in India and quite in Afghanistan, quite effective ones because they understand well how to work in that kind of environment and provided some training for security officials in India, not inside Afghanistan. Um, however, what's uh, significant now in the, in the regional environment, as I mentioned, is not just India, but India and China both have large and growing economies. And one of the obstacles to international cooperation in Afghanistan was that really there was no incentive to do it. You know, in, in Europe, one of the ways that the Balkan region was, has gradually been absorbed and stabilized has been through the incentives offered to those countries if they were able to reform sufficiently to join the European Union or become associated with it. There has been no such power of attraction in this region, um, but the rise of these two enormous economies, if it is accompanied by the building of infrastructure uh, that could provide Afghans and others with access to them, would provide many more incentives for cooperation. And I think one of the most uh, potentially positive trends for Afghanistan, not just for Afghanistan, has been the higher, much higher level of dialogue between India and China. I, I and. Of course, the recent state visit of Xi Jinping to Delhi uh, did not go by without certain problems, such as Chinese activities on the border region uh, and so on. But nonetheless, there was quite a deep uh, policy dialogue. Trade between the two countries has increased significantly. China has much more trade with India than it does with Pakistan, simply because of the size of the Indian economy. Um, and I, found, I have found myself in traveling around the region that it's much easier to get to Beijing from Delhi than it is to get there from Islamabad. Um, so uh, India certainly has a role, a very important role in Afghanistan, and the Afghans very much appreciate it. I think India is the most popular foreign country in Afghanistan. Um, but uh, it will be in cooperation with others and not as one hegemon replacing another. The 
end of this uh, uh, evening. I would like, uh, on your behalf and on behalf of the two co-organizers, to thank uh, my good friend, Dr. Ruben, Barney Ruben. This was really illuminating for us. We could not have a, a better mind to explain all of this and the complexities of these issues that sometimes we approach, even us scholars who are supposed to be a little bit more profound, we approach with a simplistic mind. I have learned a lot from uh, this uh, evening and from the presentation by uh, Barney Rubin. And I hope you uh, also uh, took advantage of uh, this evening to look at the media when uh, uh, all these so-called experts reporting from the field, at least we have now a uh, few uh, other ways to look at these events uh, more intelligently. Thank you very much. Thank you all. And you are all invited to reception. <laughs>